right. Well, good morning. This is Monday, July 10th of the year 2017. And uh, at um, uh, the top of an hour, or actually 10 minutes past the hour in many aspects of the world. And uh, my name is Linda Steer from the Xylem Group. And I am here with John Bruce from, where exactly are you in the UK, John? Um, in the county of Essex. <clears throat> And for those who are geographically challenged, you might be listening to this video. Can you um, kind of place us against it's, a larger landmark? It's on the, it's in the east, to the east of London. Indeed, it's on the Thames Estuary, the bit where I am. Wow. A place called South End on Sea. Mm. Beautiful. Thank and you. It's, it's quite nice at the moment. Yes, it's, uh, I think the highest temperature in the UK today is... Uh, is here 26 degrees Celsius. Don't ask Beautiful. me what that is. Yeah. Beautiful. Well, thank you. Welcome for to joining us this morning. And our topic today is boards of directors, trustees, and the simple question: So why are they a necessary evil? What uh, what's their function? Why even bother? So we could look at that from any aspect of that and I know that we have a few people in the chat field and we will um, engage here in a fabulous conversation and include in any comments from those of you in chat so feel free to pose questions for us so um, John, what uh, what's your anything you want to open up just about boards of directors uh, yes thank you Linda I think um, uh, how and who is it decided if a board adds value? Um, from whose perspective does a board add value? Uh, a board will sometimes say, we know we add value because, and they may be able to point to some action that they've taken that has added value to the organization's um, efforts. Uh, but if you're a, a, um, an owner, uh, how do you determine if the board adds value? If you're a, a major stakeholder, maybe a major customer or supplier, are you interested in what the board does? So it's, it's for me, it's one of those questions that is, is, um, needs to be exploded into many parts, and then we might just grab one or two of those parts and see if we can see if we can deal with it. Well, I love what you're creating here, right? That there is. Um from a comment in the chat field, there are no evil boards, just evil people, but we are talking about quite a number of different perspectives. Um, a board doesn't, board is a construct, not something that just drops out of the sky as some, you know, like going out and seeing a tree, you're not go see a board, it's something that's made up. But we're talking about the function um, of that of, of that and where is that seen as valuable from the different perspectives that you laid out and then of course there are the people who then inhabit that position and their relationship to what that is so I think that's just a whole nother adding in that perspective as well right there are the people who occupy it and then there is the function of the board itself so why don't we why don't we just start from um, you know, what is its function from um, some perspective? So is there any one of those various perspectives no. you'd like to get us going? Um, excuse me. I'm going... <laughs> Sorry, can you just run that? Yes, I, I, I will. So you've identified various different perspectives and yes. a comment from the chat field. Um, you know, not necessarily, you know, I mean, there's the people who occupy and then there's what's the function that they're occupying, and then there are people that are occupying it. So there's another perspective of putting in the human element to this. But let's just begin with a construct as, as what it is, right? It, does, yeah. it, it exists as a construct, and there are many different relationships. Which one would you want to just take on to get us started? Well, um, given that we haven't defined owner for this discussion, I, I would take the view that the board is there to govern on behalf of its owners, and therefore its owners would determine whether it has added value. 
And I guess that begs for me the question, does a board decide how it will add value or does it work in some mysterious way and hope it does? Uh, because, uh, you know, there are different approaches which boards can take. And I know the one we favour is one where the board sets out why the organisation exists for whose benefit. And uh, if you can do that, you can begin the process, I think, of pursuing the value add chain, if you like, by seeing to what extent those, um, those requirements, those ends are being accomplished and beneficiaries are getting the benefits that were set out by the board. I suppose those, for, for me, would be central to uh, whether a board is adding value. Are the organisation's outputs in line with the ends that the board has set? Um, are you going to... Uh, yes, I'm sort of like looking to see okay, if there's a chat coming in. But uh, I, um, so I, the first point that you're making here is that in practice, we might see boards that don't have a deliberate process and hoping that value might result from that. Or you take a deliberate approach that if you if a board is operating on behalf of owners that they're the one to determine what mm. those outputs are and are they aligned for that to yes. determine the value. Yes. Um, I've also gotten some instruction about facilitating this. I don't have to pay attention to everything they're chatting about in the chat field. Oh, boom. Thank you very much. Duly noted. <laughs> um, so taking a day, so any experience that you have either either way from both those different well, approaches? I joined a board um, of a community college uh, and there were a lot of people on that board and many of them had been there for a number of years and it took me about two years to work out what the board was supposed to be doing. I think I, I fell into the trap of thinking, I'm sure it will be obvious what we're supposed to be doing, but it took me two years about eight meetings to actually work it out there was no induction process no one i felt i could ask and uh, i'm sure if you had asked the board um were they valued i think they would inevitably say yes they were because nobody wants to work in something or for something that isn't valued but i found it quite difficult to um understand what the board did in relation to what I thought the college was there for. It tended to be mired in bean counting and uh, uh, making sure regulators were okay, not necessarily uh, asking the question about are we, are we providing benefits, if so, which benefits and for whom. I recall, for example, asking the chief executive at one stage, if we knew how many people applied for college, for a place in the college. And he didn't understand the question. He, why would you want to know that? So I tried a different question, which was, how many people apply for courses that the college doesn't run? And I got the same response. Why would you want to know that? And I think the board as a whole didn't see where I was coming from either. So I felt kind of lonely. Um, but it was the only way I could see that the board was adding value to this institution. It was, it was not a small institution. Um, and I'm sure they were doing lots of good work, but I suspect much of that good work was being done despite the board. Yeah. So I think the board saw itself as an extension of management, perhaps, rather than anything else. <clears throat> Very clear. Uh, so could I, um, do you mind if I just engage a little bit with your experience right there as a, as a board member raising that question? Was this, we, are you, when you were serving on this board, were you aware of the more deliberate approach of determining value from the owners when? No. So that, so here there was something that was calling you to ask that question, but um, I'm, did uh, but you're we were you were you clear where you were asking the question from let me put it that way well i i guess i thought i was but i concluded that i wasn't i was in a in a sense in a different room 
from the others. And it may well be that they were all in different rooms themselves. Mm -hmm. Never had the opportunity to explore that. But I think there was a high level of trust in the institution, uh, the, the, the governing body, the board, trusted the institution. Um, uh, but on what basis that trust existed, I don't know, other than, hey, we're all good people, aren't we? Mm -hmm. the, the, the essential questions about are we providing benefits um, for these particular people was, was, I think, it was taken for granted. Well, of course we are, otherwise we wouldn't be doing what we're doing. So a rather kind of patronising um, approach, if you will. And um, uh, I, I think for a long, long time, it was a perennial difficulty. As long as the college was busy, then we must be doing good work. We must be doing the right thing. Uh, classrooms were full. People were enrolling. And uh, if you consider that the beneficiaries are beyond those who come to learn, but maybe a wider view of, of the community at large, we had no idea if, in fact, we had disenfranchised significant members of the community because the college basically said, well, no, we don't want to do that, so clear off, you know, go yeah. somewhere else. And, that, and, and, and the... Perhaps I'm being rather harsh, but but it just seemed to me that nobody really got it quite like that. In a, in a sense, I suppose, Linda, it's it's this whole question of is the board one step up from management or one step down from the owners? And I think in those days, and I'm talking a lot of years ago now, I think the board saw itself as there to look over management's shoulder to make sure management was doing what they thought management should be doing. It's quite natural, though, isn't it? Um, that, that that's how that's how I think how most people are used to in a normal way of doing it. That if something's going well, we must be doing okay, and we must yes. be doing what we're doing. Yes. And until there is some crisis that happens, that then a group becomes a reaction to that. Either there's some crisis, or there's some crisis of somebody being on the board asking questions that no one can necessarily respond to. Right. Okay. Why? Um... I, I suppose that the the issue for me was that what what became clear um, a little later was that of course actually the board didn't understand what its job was. It was just doing what it had always done, mm -hmm. which is understandable in the absence of any other information about what the board is there for. And uh, only when I got to grips with the idea of what a board is for did it start to make sense of the kinds of questions that we should be asking ourselves and yeah. asking the organization. Hmm. Well, my wife's creeping around in the background, only we've we had something going on that she's, she's alive and not bleeding, and visibly bleeding, so I assume then, we're all right. Yeah. Forgive me one moment. As, so, well, sorry. It, it, it is... Um, you know, so far, I mean, what you're pointing to is there. there's what we would say, what's not e what board members may not even be aware of, right? We operate inside however the board is operating, um, and people may come from different directions on it, but what doesn't actually get dealt with is what, where are we asking the questions from, or what really is our role, or what's our intent here? What are we really out to fulfill? And is there something out there that we're not fulfilling that we should be fulfilling that discussions tend not to even hit there unless you've got some strategic session once a year? But yes. there's a, it's a great question um, from the chat field. So do board members try to fit in with the culture of the board or should each behave the way each thinks is right? It is a good question. Um, I think you've got to, in a sense, you have to be able to do both. Um, if you can fit in with the culture of the board, uh, then you're not instantly closing people's minds every time you open your mouth. Uh, but you, you have to think, I think, really hard and very long about how you're going to uh, spit out what's on your mind in a way that doesn't cause them to close their minds. So 
in a sense, you, you've got to be right, but you have to be right um, on, on the board's terms, not your terms, but on the board's terms. Does that make sense? It sounds a bit kind of contradictory. But. Well, in, in, no, it's, uh, it, it, makes, it makes sense, and it, but it, it, begs, um, it begs some level of uh, confidence of what your position is. Sure. Oh, right, sure. or what your role is on the board, what's the board's role. So again, we, we start to see that there's some, um, it's critical to actually know what you're in to be able to contribute something that's going to serve both the, in, inside the culture of the board and yet serve what, the, what you're bringing to the board. Yes, yes. And I, 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 and I don't think it was something that the board's naturally... Um, uh, practiced or made easy because generally people didn't speak out of turn if they had a disagreement it would be expressed in such a way that was so diplomatic you almost lost sight of the fact that they had a concern hmm. or maybe I'm just not very subtle but but I, I found it I found it very difficult at times um, and that was my own incompetence. It wasn't the board's incompetence. It was my own incompetence, my lack of experience, my inability to persuade 29 other people that I'm right and they're not. Right. <laughs> and being able, well, being able to identify that, or, which is part of the board culture, you know, are you coming from your own personal viewpoint, what yeah. you think is right, or are yeah. you actually coming from what you think is going to best serve what the board's up to as a whole and asking the question, which, right? Well, there's, you know, I mean, given that, but here's this group of people certainly committed to the organization. What's wrong with advising or helping management? Another great question from the chat field. Yes, yes. I, th I think uh, there's nothing wrong with advising or helping management if they're inviting you to advise or help them. Um, but that's not the board's job. Um, so if you're a member of a board who has some kind of wisdom, a particular wisdom that is of value to management, as opposed to the board, um, and you're prepared to provide that wisdom and some time, um, I don't have a problem with that. I don't think that's wrong at all. But what I think where it starts to go wrong is when the board sees itself as the advisor and helper of management, when management has not said, hey, I would appreciate the board's views on this. How does the board think we should deal with this or something like that? Huh. And uh, I, I recall in another setting, Linda, um, uh, my vice chair who... Uh, there was a, a kind of fairly junior nurse presenting to the board in this hospital and uh, following her presentation he told her to go away and do something and come back and tell us so I intervened not very diplomatically and said you don't have to take any notice of what he's just told you um, because he has no right to do that and uh, he of course Look very unhappy about it, as would I have done in those circumstances. But uh, you have to protect people who, are in those circumstances, are suddenly climbing over the, the the board wall into management and have people thinking that they work for them directly. And of course, they don't. So right. di directors playing manager is isn't a good idea, unless it's carefully um, thought about. That's an excellent point, I, and I think it's it's likely a a leap for many people serving on boards that the board's job, that statement, the board's job is not to advise management. So you can say a little bit more about that. That might, um, you know, yeah, you can run into things, and but that happens all the time. I think. I, think, um, uh, I suppose for me, it would it, the. Where I would pin that is to simply the idea of role clarity. If you are clear about the board's role and you are clear about management's role, we'll argue whether they're correct um, 
understanding or not later, but if you have a clarity about the board's responsibilities, management's responsibilities, individual directors' responsibilities, then you have to consider the boundaries of each of those and not stray into someone else's uh, turf, someone else's responsibilities, because that's, uh, it's, it's aggressive, it's inappropriate, it's certainly not helpful. And um, so you stay out of it. You, you may have to find words to express your frustration with the fact that you don't think they're doing their job properly. But that's for them to determine. It's not for you to determine unless it's in relation to the work they are doing immediately for the board, or at the board's behest. Hmm. So I recall a director reporting on the assets of the, of the organisation. He, he'd already submitted his report, but he opened um, his uh, speaking to it by reporting that there'd been a major uh, water leak and that a tower block was now um, suffering from a lot of water pouring down it. Well, why he chose to do that is understandable because it just happened and it was on his mind. But of course, all it, all it caused was many of the directors to be sucked into uh, demonstrating their plumbing prowess on one scale or another. And of course, that wasn't what we, we, we were there for. And it was a damn nuisance, to be quite honest, because it took ages to try and haul everybody back. If he hadn't said it, it wouldn't have mattered. Because he said it, it mattered. Okay. And it, was, it didn't belong in there. It was not the board's job to fix the plumbing. I mean, you can hear so much confusion if roles are not clear. And yes. board, board members are either the supervisor of the executive or they're working for the executive or they have their own personal comment about how they think they would want it to go. It really does beg the question about yes. what that is. Yes. Uh, I think a great observation from the chat field is that many people uh, think that they can govern intuitively coming on a board or do they actually have some um, experience about what that is. I think many people come to boards thinking, well, I know already how to do this that it isn't something to be studied as to what that is to be one. I, th I, think, I think one of the interesting aspects of a board, which is counterintuitive to people who've worked in managerial hierarchies, <clears throat> is that the board consists of many people who have to speak to one person with one voice. On the assumption there is a chief executive, the board delegates to the chief executive. So you've got this gang round a table of 7, 12 or 30, however many it might be, needing to speak with one voice to one person. That person goes away and inevitably has a team that they will then address and assign responsibilities to. And that becomes a traditional management hierarchy. But the idea of inverting it, which is what a board does, basically, many people speaking to one person. There's, I don't think there's any other example of it in organization hierarchy where you have one person reporting to many in the way yeah. that happens with a board. And I, I think that recognition, when, when I heard it expressed much better than that, but when I heard it expressed, that helped me um, say to myself, hold on a minute, am I clear about what you should be doing and what I should be doing and what the board should be doing? And uh, if I'm not clear, then fine, you, you know, you say so. But uh, um, on the assumption that you have in the room the board and the person to whom the board delegates, uh, then you can only speak with one voice to that person if... if if the chief executive hears different um, tasks being described to him or her, then there's just confusion. Mm. And yes, Robert, uh, I, yeah. I, Robert I, and the chair let the plumbing conversation continue. No, I didn't. I eventually lost my temper 
and told them all to shut up. <laughs> it was described in the in the post board evaluation um, form as a bit grumpy. Well, you're probably speaking for many others in the room who didn't <laughs> even know to speak up about there was some role that the chair might have about it. <laughs> But then there's also this great, um, you know, with regards to one voice, that whole concept is the board, you know, as you're sitting there around the table, are you aware that one voice is now going to be representative of something beyond just the people that are sitting in the room? Because oftentimes it just becomes who's ever in the room that now we're going to individually decide. So there's this shift from being an individual to being uh, aware of we're, we're speaking for something here, not just my opinion and what, what are we all saying who happen to be here. Yes, I, I, think, I think that is um, uh, a challenge because in, in some ways we're, we're looking for what we think of as the best idea from someone around the table rather than our best idea. Mm. And uh, that, that working together to collaborate and, and um, build upon other, people, uh, other p- people's suggestions is, um, uh, isn't something that necessarily comes easily to people. Damn sure it didn't come easy to me. Mm. Still doesn't. <laughs> it is. I mean, it's not naturally how we operate, which, you know, really comes back to... Um, Uh, the beginning part of our conversation here with the value that's added. I think, you know, here we have this thing and we get through it the best way that we get through it. Um, But to have clear value, it's just in in your comments, John, it's going to require noticing, excuse me, I've got a few... uh, Right, we can go on for longer. Yeah, so we can go on for longer. <laughs> I do know I do know we have some other business to manage as to whether we continue on this discussion or begin to wrap it. Um a just really fascinating conversation, John, right? That to really have clear value or to say if we have value, what would be required in the way we operate and what is the val- what really is our role becomes a whole different level of conversation versus yeah. just falling into what's uh, what's already there mm-hmm. so i think we should just have clearance to i didn't know if any of our um um uh, chatfield folk wanted to um uh, step in i can uh, i can disappear so to speak and uh, hand over if someone else wants to come in well i do know we wanted to test another um format of having two people on um i guess we might since we have the space we might just see whether we could Mm. um do that right now uh but if first of all john just thank you um for deepening expanding the conversation anything else right now that there's for you that you'd want to put a coda on where we are at the moment Uh, no, I don't think so, Linda. I hope what I said made sense. I hope it was helpful. Um, there is so much more to be said, and I'm sure others will do a great job of saying it far far better than I can, and in the right accent. Yeah. Ah, no. <laughs> I could listen to you all day, John. <laughs> Beautiful. <Smoothie. laughs> so thank you. Uh, uh, what I'm going to do right now, John, hold hold where you are, and I'm yeah. going to uh, invite uh, Sherry Jennings from now um, 3,000 miles in the opposite direction from where I'm located in North Carolina. So, uh, Sherry, uh, if you will join in. Sherry, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. We have our two eminent experts from different spheres of the world so and you are um i give you the same opportunity sherry so where exactly geographically are you and to pinpoint us to something that's um um a, a landmark uh how about the pacific ocean that's a good one <laughs> So we go from east of the Atlantic and on the edge of the uh, Thames River to the Pacific Ocean. Fabulous. Thank you for yeah. joining us. Yeah, so thank I know, you. I, 
I know that you've uh, heard the first part of our conversation here, and now we're just adding in the dynamic of having uh, two fabulous guests for interchange. So anything you observed so far, or anything you want to add to this discussion about boards? Yeah. So um, the way you started this whole conversation was boards there for some reason to add some value. And at some point, we acknowledged that there's collective wisdom on the board. Uh, how do you tap into it? I mean, how do you, how do you best tap into what's there? How, how do you begin to get the discussion and dialogue away from, as, as John was talking, the administrivia of the going over the financials and whether or not we bought too many paper clips last month to, you know, you actually using the collective wisdom there and how best to prepare the board to be able to use their collective wisdom. I, thoughts? Well, the agenda. You know, I control the agenda. Um, the way in which the agenda item is expressed or shaped will, will help or not. Um, if there is a short paper that people could have received beforehand to help them focus, that might also be useful. But it's tricky to put a time limit on, on the discussion. I mean, you need to put a time limit on it because you can't spend forever on it, but uh, it's difficult to estimate how much time would you need. And I guess be prepared to um, take a recess or, or defer taking it any further, maybe next meeting or something like that it gives people more time to think about it if, if it seems that will be uh, helpful. Well, I, uh, that's great. Um, first of all, Sherry and then John, you know, as far as the structure for that. So, you know, a question, um, people have many talents. Do they know which talent or what their skill or what their contribution is? Are they aware of what contribution the board would want or is useful to the board? And is the board or the board chair aware of what it might expect or seek to want to hear from various board members? Uh, we used to use thinking hats as a means of trying to um, uh, identify how someone could play to their own strengths when contributing to something that the board was doing. Uh, because there is no there is no perfect set of behavior uh, so if you have someone who always seems to be wearing a, a, a black hat I think you know they're very critical and uh, not the kind of person you'd want to go for a drink with necessarily but they can be enormously helpful uh, in finding the the holes in something that is being suggested and indeed, they could be invited to please find the holes rather than, oh, no, it's him again. And uh, that, that, that way of thinking could be valued, especially if in the, in the room there are many people who are very kind of creative and positive and bubbly and think we can do everything, can't we? And uh, you know, the black hat thinker can provide a useful break um, if things start to get a bit out of hand. So it but, sounds but I, like, I don't know who they are. sorry. So it sounds like boards need a sorting hat like they have at Hogwarts. <laughs> that is for houses rather than styles of thinking. <laughs> that could be the same thing because it is yeah. a bit about style. Edward de Bono is uh, the, uh, the inventor of six thinking hats, I think it is. Mm -hmm. that's, no, that's very interesting. That's, yeah. I, I think that's a good point. Um, I've found that if a board begins to develop a structure around its own work, i.e. Um, explicitly delegating to the CEO and feeling comfortable about being able to monitor organizational performance, that it tends to shake out a little bit um, in terms of what their, where their interests go. Um, and and it, it was rather interesting for me that um, one board, uh, very clearly said, we need a governance committee. We need a committee that works on board work and also helps the board make sure that it's adhering to what it said it would do in terms of its own job. 
Um, and and uh, they very naturally selected themselves onto this committee, and it was it was really interesting how much they were in, they wanted to learn and are, and just have voracious appetites for reading about it now, and and want to want to be the board's expert on on the whole topic, which is kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. I mean, sometimes they do self select, and then you'll also find people who self select and say. I didn't sign up for this governance stuff and I just want to help. So I don't want to do this anymore. So if you felt, have you, the two of you found something similar? Um, uh, I'll let Linda answer that. Yeah. Oh, well, um, yes. I mean, I, I, I have been on so many boards that, um, you know, everybody has their own version of what they think they should be contributing and how the board should operate. So it's all rather chaotic. I mean, I, we, we sort of go along, it sort of has gone along the way it's gone along. Um, but I think that whole clarity is so critical um, to know what you're contributing here and what's going to provide value. Yes. Yes. I'm, I'm, I recall um, when the college was um, developing uh, a new site and uh, quite innovative thinking about the, the building and how it would operate, uh, we coincidentally appointed to the board an architect. Uh, and he was quite a famous architect and he had a lot of experience in doing big things. And uh, of course, uh, he thought he was going to be designing the new college building and actually there were no plans for him to design anything. Thank you very much. What we wanted was his wider wisdom. Yeah. And so he, he stayed, I think for three meetings and then, then resigned. It was a pity, but on the other hand, he probably did the right thing as far as he was concerned. He'd, yeah. he'd got the idea that in his head that he would be designing this building. And actually well, somebody else would <clears throat> um, I mean, one theme that's beginning to emerge here through this whole conversation is clarity. Um, just that point of somebody being a devil's advocate, who mostly, I would think, if people are always coming up criticizing or finding the dark holes, that a normal, we you don't, know, let's avoid these conversations and lose some valuable input. But if somebody knew, knows that as valuable that that is what this person's providing john as you suggest mm -hmm. um but it does beg for clarity about what are we here for what's our individual role here and what's the role of the board and what adds value mm -hmm. um really begs for some um system agenda role play not only role play but clarity of roles um as instrumental for why you'd even bother to come together in a meeting Yes, yes. There's, there's a, a, another thought I had, Linda, as you were saying that was the extent to which um, uh, members of the board own the whole agenda or only see themselves as owning a part of it. Mm -hmm. You know, um, John, you, you've, you've been, yeah. I'm sorry, you've been a chair um, of a board and uh, I, I'd be interested in your observations on I mean, when you say that people own some part of the agenda, it's typically because they're bringing their own um, mm. experience mm. In, in their job or their work or whatever to the board, and so they feel like they have some expertise. But as a chair, did you find any good ways to help people transcend from uh, that, that place of bringing that skill level that, that really is a management skill up into a, a, a good skill to be used on the board in terms of discussing the, the wider and broader um, discussion? I, I, I don't think I seriously experienced somebody saying, this is nothing to do with me, so I'm, you know, I can't contribute to this. I have come across people saying, well, I, I have no experience of this, therefore I don't think I can contribute. And uh, it may well be a matter of confidence that they need to be prepared to ask the stupid question because the only stupid question really is the one you don't ask. And um, 
they can be enormously helpful when they think they know nothing because uh, they can provide useful challenge and test to establish thinking. Because after all, uh, there are a lot of very skilled people that built the Titanic. Hmm. And uh, I'm sure they were all pretty certain they were doing the right thing. And yet somehow or other, it, it hit a rather large ice cube and sank and a lot of people died. So um, I'm sure somebody somewhere would, was probably saying up in the, up in the bridge of, of the ship, you know, I think there might be an iceberg out there, Captain. And the captain saying, no, no, we'll never get any icebergs this far south. Trust me, my boy, I know. Hmm. Scary. But, um, well, you know, please give us the village idiots, if that's one way of looking at it. Who's going to be village idiot tonight? Who's going to ask the most stupid question? And I will personally send you a box of chocolates if you do. Well, well, if we're to believe the, the, the movie Titanic, you're, you're absolutely right. It was the, uh, the civilian who asked the question about the number of lifeboats and did the math and said there aren't enough. And that, if that question had been asked before the boat left. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. then part of it, part of it was hubris. Well, we'll not, we'll never need them because the boat's unsinkable. But well, exactly, which is like somebody, um, somebody perhaps they had that thought and they didn't say it. Mm -hmm. And if they did say it, it would be, oh, we're not going to need them, and there's such certainty that this is the biggest and the best, so don't worry about it, and everyone else going along with it, which so classic for even a board of directors, right? Um, the value of diverse voices and being able to ferret out and listen to that kind of level of diversity and ongoingly be questioning, are we adding value? Yes. So, yeah. Um, what I'd, uh, we are coming to eight minutes before the top of the hour. I know that we are planning just a very short debrief session beyond this, but I think at this point, if unless there's something burning to contribute from either the chat field or John or Sherry that we might conclude um, this discussion at this point. Yeah, I think, yeah. I think some very good uh, points were raised, especially, John, um, from your experience and expertise uh, working with boards and, and pointing out some of the, uh, the things that we might tend to overlook or not think about when we join a board, and then also some of the remedies that might come from uh, working with people on a board. I, I think there was a lot of good discussion between you and Linda, so thank you. Yeah. I, I could just quote John Carver, I think, that just because something's simple doesn't mean it's easy. And, and I, I don't think that the board's role is terribly complicated. We can make it complicated, but uh, if, we, if we think of it as simple, um, we, we fall into the trap of thinking, well, it should be easy, so if it's not easy, there must be something else wrong. Uh, so it just sprung to mind there. Yeah. A beautiful quote to end this part of the discussion. I'm just going to slug this at some point as Robert joins us that this is Monday, July 10th, and we've been discussing why boards of directors. So um, we're now officially complete with this conversation. And now we begin our post-mortem and post-death Good it's Lord. Being lonely, Robert. Yes, and my first is that I do have a call right at the top of the hour, so I need to scoot off about one minute before. But here we are.